your body will absolutely make cortisol if it if it perceives stress. I mean, it doesn't know the traffic jam isn't a bear. Mm. Welcome to the Food Matters Podcast, your home for health and wellness. My name is James Colhoun, filmmaker and founder of foodmatters.com, and I am your host on this journey to inner and outer transformation. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to take a short moment to talk to you about the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program, because studying nutrition completely changed my life. It helped me to heal my father, get him off six different medications, lose 50 pounds, and completely regain and transform his life and health. But the problem is, is that we're not really taught about nutrition in our schooling system. The medical profession is rarely pronouncing the facts of using nutrition as medicine, and we have a fast food industry that thrives off misleading consumers. So if you're looking to learn about how to use nutrition as medicine to either heal yourself or a loved one or help prevent chronic disease, or you want to take that next step on your study and nutrition journey and become a certified nutrition coach, then the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program is for you. This is a 10-week or self-paced internationally accredited certification program designed to take you through some of the most important topics on the la- and the latest research when it comes to nutrition and natural healing, including gut healing, autoimmune conditions, balancing hormones naturally, detoxification, biochemical individual approaches to nutrition, plus it brings together the best that we know about uh, nutrition science and anthropological research and bringing these two approaches together to help you cut through the confusion about what to eat and what to avoid for optimum health. To find out more about the nutrition certification program, plus to download your curriculum guide, head to foodmatters.com forward slash study. You can pause this right now. It will only take you 30 seconds. That's foodmatters.com forward slash study, or you can head to the show notes for more information. Have a beautiful day. Welcome to this exclusive masterclass on understanding and balancing your hormones naturally. My guest today is a world-class expert on this topic and you are not going to want to miss this conversation. If you suffer from PMS or bloating or even mood swings or sugar cravings or cycle issues or irregular cycles or any thyroid or uh, hypothyroid or hypothyroid conditions, Hashimoto's, unexplained weight gain or weight loss, then this conversation today is for you. If you're scrolling on Instagram or Facebook or watching TV, put it down and focus because this is going to be life-changing information. I first met today's guest actually at a private dinner party about five or six years ago, and she gave me some information which I passed to Laurentine. It was so simple and so profound, and it had an incredible effect on her health. So you're not going to want to miss some of this information. In today's masterclass, we're going to be covering topics such as what are hormones and how do they impact the body. We're also going to be going into discussing thyroid conditions, Hashimoto's, etc., plus top foods and substances that can impact and throw your hormones out of balance, and also foods to eat to help balance your hormones naturally, and some tips and tricks on this topic. So today, my guest is Dr. Temi Meraglia, and she is somebody that is an expert on this topic, and she's also an expert teacher in the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program. Uh, She's a hormone expert, a double board certified MD, keynote speaker, CEO and founder of Global Global Stemology and the Seattle Stem Cell Center, and also the uh, best-selling author of the book, The Hormone Secret, and it's available at her website, Dr. Tammy.com. Hey, Dr. Tammy, how are you? Hey, I am choosing to be grateful. How are you? Beautiful. Amazing. I'm fantastic. And I'm, I'm excited to be speaking to you. And when this interview and this masterclass was organized, I really remembered that time that we first met. And, and I was just sharing with you some of the questions that I had about hormone health and hormone issues. And you gave me some great advice. And I passed that on to some women that I've since met. And it just goes to show that hormones, they seem like this insurmountable uh, concept to understand. I mean, it freaks everybody out. Everyone can understand vitamins and minerals, but then when you say hormones, it's like chemical messengers. I don't get it. So what, what really are hormones and how do they play such an integral role in our overall health and well-being and how we feel and look, for instance? Yes. Well, our hormones, like you said, they're 
they are messengers. And I think that people get a little bit freaked out because there's been this conversation about cancer. You know, we, we find out that if you have cancer, the first thing they do is say, oh, is it estrogen receptive? Is it is it linked to that? If you take hormones, are you going to get cancer? If you get prostate cancer, is that, you know, there's a hormone therapy for that. So there's a lot of fear that what is happening with our hormones can cause cancer. But hormones are really just messengers. But if you think about life, what would life be like without any communication? It wouldn't work at all. Mm. So that's what your hormones are doing. And it's a beautiful communication that's more like music and that each one of them plays an important role like a symphony and you know if the violins sound terrible at the symphony the whole symphony sounds terrible so yeah. they all need to be balanced and that's one thing that i think we're missing in traditional medicine you know i'm an md mm. a regular medical doctor but i had to go back to school do studying and learn about functional medicine and become naturopathic medicine certified so that's where this is the idea of optimizing and balancing that's so important mm. yeah i think m maybe many women listening to this m by reading out the symptoms that i was uh discussing earlier probably feel like they're listening to a heavy metal band and not really <laughs> an orchestra or bach <laughs> or a chopin or something like this um you know it's it seems like such a complex topic however hormones really drive many of the issues that women are suffering from and i know through food matters interviewing many experts on this topic over the years and and having a, a mostly female team uh because I, I i respect uh in business the emotional intelligence of women uh extremely um and interacting with with women in my life it, it, it's common that you know there's pms struggles there's you know mood swings sugar cravings so much of this i i think maybe there's a disconnect between that being hormonal. I mean, PMS, of course, but some of the other conditions, unexplained weight gain, et cetera. What do you see are some of the primary symptoms that women experience when their hormones are out of balance? And maybe symptoms that they might not be aware are hormone related. Well, I think the latter is the most important and the most common is that uh, even anxiety and depression is in my books, something that should be pursued and investigated as a hormone imbalance and or deficiency before mm. any antidepressant is talked about. Mm. Um, I'm not against medication. I'm an MD. I think that there's a place for it. But why first? Mm. Why do we choose cutting and drugging as the first option rather than looking at root cause and seeing if we can balance it? Other things that are you know, sometimes not thought of as a hormone related symptom is sleep. Mm. You know, if you wake up between two and four in the morning with your eyes wide awake and you don't feel groggy, that's a progesterone deficiency until proven otherwise. Um, when you have issues around your menses or PMS, those people are more commonly accepting to be hormone related, mm -hmm. but your hair is a hormone related function your bone health mm. we used to many years ago treat osteopenia and osteoporosis with hormone balancing so it has a great deal on how we look feel and function brain fog and i think the biggest is energy and vitality and what do i mean by vitality because it's such a a vague word. We kind of know what it means, but we really don't. So women, I find when they're having hormone imbalances and, and deficiencies, things aren't fun mm. anymore. Mm. The things that used to bother you really bother you. So perhaps your, your partner left their clothes on the floor and it used to bother you, but now you want to choke them. <laughs> <laughs> That's hormones. Mm -hmm. So it, it takes that enjoyment out of life. Mm. I'm laughing because I can relate in, in <laughs> on being on the receiving end of that. Um, wow. And especially I just wrote down some notes here. I mean, hair and, and sleep and, and mood. I mean, these are, uh, are, are heavy afflictions 
to, to carry through life. I mean, if you're not sleeping well, I mean, you know, in studying health and nutrition, I mean, nutrition matters a lot and we'll speak to that today. But sleep is the new nutrition, really, when it comes to organic food and raw foods and natural foods. Sleep is the new topic that needs addressing. And you're saying that this has a, uh, hormones have an impact on the quality of sleep. Yes, and you know, it's particularly progesterone, but mm -hmm. cortisol as well. Mm -hmm. If there was a fire in my house, I would grab my progesterone and my children. My husband can run for himself. <laughs> It's so powerful. Um, and and who, who has ever gone to the doctor or read a book or anything about insomnia and then the first thing that they talk about is hormone balancing and progesterone? It doesn't happen, mm. but it should. Mm. And it's bioidentical. It's, it's so easy. Some progesterone is even over the counter. Mm. Wow. I mean, this... I mean, I'm reflecting back to the conversation we had at this private dinner and you were you were saying something similar. This this progesterone sort of cream or something is so critical uh, to helping restore that balance. And this is just one part of a bigger story of the, the hormonal story, but progesterone in particular. Um, and I mean, sleep, when, when we think about sleep as well, women and men for that matter, as soon as you start to cross over the 35, 40 year old sort of barrier, you notice that aging is more visible and people want to look youthful and healthy and vibrant. And sleep is one of the biggest implicators in looking healthy and vibrant, because if you're not well rested and if you're stressed out, this has an impact not only on your immune system, but also on your, on your skin health which is one of the largest organs in the body, right? So talk to me about hormones and skin as well, because many women experience breakouts and all sorts of issues, maybe around their cycle or potentially in relation to sweets and sugar cravings, which is a very common uh, symptom as well. Well, and you know, one of the things I did for many years, almost 15 years is own a holistic medical spa. So I did a lot of skin treatments <laughs> and we always, talked about beauty from the inside out and it's not just a slogan it really matters i mean your your estrogen has a lot to do with how saggy your skin is women can tell you that when they look at a picture from them between the ages of 35 and 45 there's some difference but it's not shocking mm. 45 to 55 there's some big differences and then 55 to 65 it is just a completely different game if you haven't balanced and optimized your hormones the other thing about hormones is that people forget that what you think and how you feel affect your hormones now how the heck is that well after th this magic age that you m mentioned about 35 most of our th hormones, like our sex hormones, not your thyroid, that still stays where it is, mm -hmm. but estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, go down to be produced in the adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. And that's where your stress hormones are also produced. And they're these tiny little walnut-sized glands that sit on top of your kidneys. And they are responsible for responding to your thoughts and your feelings of stress. And they're tiny, remember, so they don't have enough time, energy, or raw ingredients to make the hormones that bless your life hmm. if they have to continuously deal with the hormones about stress in mm. your life. Mm. And you asked specifically about skin. Well, cortisol is very inflammatory and there isn't anything that will age you more than inflammation. Wow. And so cortisol and the production of cortisol from your thoughts and your feelings. Mm -hmm. And pe people don't believe me, just think about what happens to your body physically when you're driving and then a police car comes behind you with the sirens and the lights on. Mm -hmm. You have a body reaction, right? Your eyes dilate, your palms sweat, your breathing becomes more rapid, your heart rate goes up. Full on body response. Why? Because of the thought yeah. that you're going to get pulled over and you're going to get a ticket. Mm -hmm. 
I like to think of our thoughts and our feelings like the doctor. Mm -hmm. And doctors write prescriptions. Yes. And then the prescription goes to the pharmacy. And the pharmacist does not have a medical license. They just dispense the medication that's on the Mm -hmm. list, on the prescription. Well, your hypothalamus is your pharmacist. In your brain, your hypothalamus and your thalamus communicate directly with your thyroid and then all the other hormones in your body and all the other organs. So you really are the CEO of your hormone health and and much more. Wow, I love that. I mean, this speaks to a topic that I I remember when Deepak Chopra was interviewed by Tony Robbins, and we probably know those two characters. They're quite um, boisterous. uh, and and loud and and impactful um, leaders in you know the health, human, psychology, personal development space. And Deepak in this interview was talking about how inside our bodies we have the capability to produce more powerful medications than known to man. We can produce you know pain medication. We can produce adrenaline, cortisol. Like it's unbelievable. And if we only knew that we had that power, we would treat our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions and the way we sleep and how we eat so much differently. However, we've really been taught, Dr. Tammy, to, to, to outsource our, our, you know, this outsource the collection of, of these medications and substances externally. And we externalize a lot of our thoughts. I mean, yogic tradition teaches us too. We're externalizing our thoughts and our validation and our love and everything of the world where inside is all of this magical kingdom you know, so from an Eastern philosophy and also from Deepak Chopra's sort of medical doctor perspective and what you're saying, we have the capability to heal ourselves, providing we provide the correct environment, which you say is is the trick. So how can you stay calm when the police officer is there or how can you bring more peace and calm to your life? So that's a, a big, big thing to think about. Well, and I don't think you can, Yeah. but what I, you're going I don't mean to be depressing, yeah. but, <laughs> but it's not about not reacting. Mm. It's about how long do you stay there? Nice. Because we were designed to react. We were designed to run for our life and, and get away from the bear. Mm. But it really was designed to be a short-term thing. Mm. So how long are you chewing on stress? Mm. That's the question, and that's what keeps it chronic. And, and you know, it, it, people don't think of meditation as a way to improve your hormone health, but it really can. Mm-hmm. There's this whole other thing called cortisol steel. And so your body will absolutely make cortisol if it, if it perceives stress. I mean, it doesn't know the traffic jam isn't a bear. Mm. It doesn't know that the emails and the meeting and your boss and the toddler aren't dangerous to your physical life. So it responds. But we were never designed to have this 24 seven. We were designed to respond and, and then stop. Cortisol steel is when your body takes the ingredients and if you look at the hormone tree, you'll go down and where things are made and it literally shunts it over to cortisol production Mm. because you have to respond. Mm. And so things like testosterone and DHEA and estrogen and progesterone aren't being made. Mm. Wow. Wow. That's big. I mean, you think about progesterone... DHEA, I mean, these are key healthy hormones to have in balance or that, that, that women in particular need in higher amounts to, as you say, sleep better, to have a better quality cycle, to have less mood swings and, and outbreaks. And stress long term is one of the biggest contributors to breaking that down. Wow, that's uh, something to write down, men and women, I would say, because stress is a is a is a chronic condition in the West. I mean, having been grateful to interview many experts on this topic, like Dispenser and Bruce Lipton and so forth, and Wim Hof, and here you are as more of a hormone specialist saying, hey, same problem, different impact, right? Uh, that's that's. And I, I love how Dr. Joe says that meditation mm. is mm. like 
animal training. You know, it, it's it's like everybody says, oh, I can't meditate. Of course you can't. You you aren't practicing. Yeah. You're going to suck. Yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. It's like puppy training. Mm. You're just training your mind. And then your mind goes, oh, I'm hungry. I want a snack. Ah, ah, ah. Stay. Yeah. Oh, I wonder what I should buy for dinner for t- groceries for tomorrow. Ah, ah, ah. Stay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's just a a practice and you just have to do it so you train your brain and nobody thinks of that as balancing your hormones but it couldn't be more powerful i wish i could charge five thousand dollars for meditation and brain training because then people would take it super serious but it's free (laughs) Wow. Okay, so you've just received, listening to this masterclass right now, a huge breakthrough. One of the cheapest, safest, most effective hormone balancing uh, prescriptions out there from Dr. Temi is to practice meditation. And I'm so glad you just said that because before this call, it's in the morning here, I practiced my meditation and I calmed my body. So I feel good that I've done that now. Thank you for making me feel great about my practice. So let's continue. Um, what, are, what are some of the main culprits when it comes to food or household items? Or, you know, we've spoken about stress and its implication on hormones. Now let's speak to everyday sort of products in the house or foods that are particularly on the Dr. Tammy no-go list when it comes to uh, interrupting or, you know, decreasing hormones that we need to have, in particular the sex hormones that we're talking about, you know, progesterone, uh, estrogen, etc. Yes, and thyroid also is very affected by food. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, our our thyroid, when you're in utero, before you're born, when you're in the womb, your thyroid isn't out there. It's one of the, the last things to be presented to the world. Um, so it doesn't interact with with its environment. And when, when you're born, your thyroid is then you know, out there and getting exposed to everything and interacting with everything. So what we did in the United States and Canada is we decided that fluffy bread was much more delicious than dense, nutrient dense, hard bread of Europe. Mm. And so they modified, and I'm not talking about the recent you know, pesticides and things like that. I'm talking about a long, long, long time ago, decades and decades ago, they modified the wheat crop so that it had more gluten, about 500 times more gluten in the crop. Why? Because it makes it fluffy. Well, it turns out that that uh, gluten tricks some people's thyroid and activates an antibody so that your body starts thinking a confusing thought and starts to attack itself. So here's the problem, right? People, when I have somebody who is diagnosed as Hashimoto's because that's what that is, right? Hashimoto's is an autoimmune condition. Your body has become confused and it's now attacking itself and very quickly it's not going to produce any hormones that will bless your life and you'll have to take medication to help it along and i say to them well stop the destruction i'm sorry but you can't have gluten and they say oh i've really cut down well i have two things to say about that one is It's like saying that you have a broken foot and you only get it stomped on once in a while and you still expect it to heal. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. The other Mm -hmm. thing is, is that you have to understand a tiny bit of medical physiology. Antibodies live about three-ish months. So it's Christmas time and you just say, oh, I'm just going to have a little bit of pumpkin pie and a little bit of stuffing with my my turkey, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Gluten, gluten. Great. So your body has ramped up their antibodies because it saw this antigen called gluten that confused it, made it think that it was thyroid and an attack. So now that's 
end of December. You've got January, February, March. Now we're at Easter and you say, oh, but it's Easter brunch. I really just, just this one time, I've been so good. I'm, I'm going to have eggs Benedict mm. and I'm going to have a Easter pastry or I'm going to have some, some other sweets. So now you had antibodies that whole time and now you just amped it up again. Mm. April, May, June, July. You either are having a party with Americans or you are American or July 1st, you're with Canadians. You're going to have, oh, I've been so good for months. I'm going to have a hot dog or a hamburger. Again, antibodies up. Mm. And then July, August, September, October, November. Oh, it's Thanksgiving. Mm. I'm just going to have a little piece of pumpkin pie. And you're back on the side. So do you see how four times a year what you eat has maintained a full-on attack and has perpetuated your Hashimoto's for the entire year? Mm, wow. And this also goes to, speaks to women who have hormone issues in general, right? This is creating the same condition, whether or not they're identified as having Hashimoto's or not. Is that correct? This, this gluten still has an impact. In well, and there's another condition with thyroid called the production of reverse T3. Mm -hmm. I don't know if your listeners have heard of it, but T3 is the active th hor thyroid hormone. It's the one that does all the work. And your body doesn't actually, your thyroid doesn't produce it. It has, it produces T4 and it has to go to the kidneys and liver and some in the skin and some other places, get converted to active T3. And it does this with this enzyme called 5' prime deiodinase. And that iodine, iodinase is an important thing to remember for later. When you eat gluten in many, many, many people, it causes the loss of the prime. And then your enzyme ends up being 5-D-I-O-D-N-A-S. Well, the, that doesn't, make, doesn't work as well. And it produces reverse T3. Reverse T3 is a dud. It fits perfectly into the receptor, blocking any other possibility, and it has no activity. Mm. So eating has caused this reverse T3. And I bet you if we took a poll of your listeners, and I know you have tens of thousands, but literally if we took a poll, mm. you would find about 1% of those people have had reverse T3 tested by their regular doctor. Mm. So people are not diagnosed as understanding that this overconsumption of modern wheat is having such a deleterious impact on their health in particular in particular their their hormone health and their thyroid health wow that's yes big and news. mercury is the other thing that affects mm -hmm. the five prime diiodinase wow okay so we've spoken about gluten and its impact uh what what other foods or products that are particularly deleterious to health when it comes to hormone health and the thyroid etc well, I think that one of the things people overlook is the things that you smell and the things that you put on your body. So skin care is very important. You want to make sure that there's no parabens. You want to make sure that that what you're using, and I know, I get it. I, I'm, I'm past 55. I'm on that other side. I get it. I want to use skin care that's actually going to make a difference. But those chemicals, oh my gosh, they disrupt your hormones. And some of those candles and things that we use, we don't think about it. But really, how do things get into our body? Well, we either eat it, mm -hmm. we absorb it, or we, we inhale mm -hmm. it. So don't forget, I often thought that um, there should be a, a thing on Uber and oh. lift on those car ride share things that I could press for no fragrance, no car yes. fresheners. I would pay yes, more. I would pay more too. I'm so glad you just said that. I actually had an hour long car trip and I got in the car and he was running. This was just literally three days ago and he had the windows up and the air conditioning on and I opened the door and I just smelt this waft of this artificial freshener and I just jumped in the car and put my window down 
and he was like, okay, so we're doing a Windows down drive, which they don't, they, you know, they don't like, they don't like that. He didn't like it, but I'm like, dude, yeah. I'm not doing Windows up today. And so I, he put all the windows down and I put my head near the window for the hour long trip just to keep some fresh oh. air, but I hear you. And even some stores, I remember in the US uh, in sort of the mid 2000s, I used to shop at Abercrombie and Finch and they would spray and like essentially, you know, perfume the entire store and well and we put perfume on, and our, we put bodies. It on our bodies too but i was not the person that put yeah. it on my body so i would i was aware of this at this stage and then i'd go in and i'd be like wow this is being imposed upon me and then you go into the restrooms at at a at a at a, at a restaurant or somewhere at a, at a diner and they've got you hear that in the corner you're like whoa what is this you know and it's this timed spray so we are being inundated with a, by a, a hand sanitizer. Mm, wow. Okay. So these are all hormone disruptors in your book and, and really need to be avoided at, at, as much as possible. Absolutely. Iodine is a very important thing that I think you should get from food. Mm -hmm. You know, we have countries that have iodine rich diets like um, Japan that don't have near as much breast cancer. You actually have more iodine receptors in your mm -hmm. breast than you do in your mm -hmm. thyroid and uh, less thyroid disease. So eating natural sources like seaweed and fish and things mm -hmm. like that. And uh, you and I have, have some common interests in a a group of islands called Vanuatu and they don't have, even though they're islands, they don't have any fish um, around them anymore. Mm -hmm. So they eat these tubers and these root vegetables for the majority of their mm -hmm. diet and they get these large goiters. Mm -hmm. The thyroid just grows from hypothyroidism all because of the diet. Mm -hmm. So we need iodine, we need seaweed, sea vegetables. I mean, these are high on the list of, of great foods and fish as well. Any particular types of fish that you are on your sort of approved list as being high in iodine and, and healthy as well? Well, you know, the, the iodine is, is you're going to have it in shrimp mm -hmm. and things like that. But I like to try and, and have variety. Mm -hmm. So you want to have some days where you're getting like the good oils mm -hmm. and you've got your salmon mm -hmm. and um, nice. so just a variety. And But seaweed is fantastic. And people say, well, I don't really like seaweed. Well, you don't need a lot. Yeah. You can just sprinkle it on your salad. Um, a lot of times I treat food like medicine so i'll just crumple it up on a big spoon and i'll just take it it, it, it doesn't matter if i like mm. it i just have a chug of water afterwards yeah. it's the same yeah. as sauerkraut yeah. for the microbiome i don't like mm. fermented mm. food but i eat it every day a big yes, spoon i do as well i love i actually love fermented food so that's a nice one well, that's good. I'm so happy because it's yucky, and but nice. I do it. <laughs> okay, so we've covered some of the sort of culprits and some of the nutrients that can positively impact um, our health, and I'd, I'd like to get to more of that as we get along, as we become, as we develop more sort of practicality in this masterclass. But one of the things I want to speak to now is just what what are some of the other more chronic conditions that people might not think are, are hormone related that actually are? You just mentioned one there. I mean, breast breast cancer in particular. You're saying, you know, if your hormones are disrupted and if you do not have enough iodine in your diet and if you're potentially disrupting your hormones with fragrances or also eating too much gluten or refined grain products, then that could lead to a, a breast cancer condition. And I've, there's lots of research that I've also read about Japanese women have very low incidence of breast cancer, potentially because of the selenium and the iodine. And then they go to America and they, their incidence of cancer in, improves and increases, should I say, to the same level of American women. So how much does that play a role and, and what sort of other chronic conditions are there that might be overlooked from a, a hormone perspective in terms of its implications? Well, and I think also the, all of the estrogen-related cancers, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, those kinds of things, it, it stems from being um, estrogen-dominant. And so you don't necessarily get more estrogen. You just have an imbalance where your progesterone, which is supposed to be the yang to your estrogen's yin, 
goes down and progesterone leaves women first and it leaves us fastest and it's totally connected to the amount of stress that you mm. have because it's either cortisol or progesterone and progesterone's the valium that bathes the female mm. mind and so your brain doesn't do both so being estrogen dominant is is the biggest problem there i think that the other thing to think about which is even more problematic though it's not talked about as much as breast cancer is osteoporosis mm. So 50% of women who who break a hip, and, and let's be clear, women commonly don't fall and break a hip. They fall because their hip broke. Mm. Okay, wow. Osteoporosis means there's holes in your bone. And it's really a, a hormone issue, first and foremost. It really wow. is. Wow. So when we're speaking about hormones some of the common things that i hear you talking about and that i hear as well in my in my studies and research over the years is this idea of of estrogen dominance and not enough uh progesterone that seems to be one of the key issues particular particularly with pms mood swings sugar cravings um etc when we say mood swings that's like what you said before when something simple like leaving a towel on the ground would be okay that's okay and it turns into like a, a criminal offense in the household um <clears throat> so that's what you're talking about in terms of not having enough progesterone this sort of hormone that bathes the female spirit to help them be more calm and relaxed and then being estrogen dominant now i hear a lot about particular substances that cause estrogen dominance so what are the key implicators in why our estrogen is so high um, and then what are some of the ways that we can bring it down potentially or what are some of the ways that we can increase our progesterone well in some of the foods that are out there you know that soy is you can argue both ways whether or not it's good or bad but but there are estrogen there are foods that act like mm -hmm. estrogen and soy is one okay. of them. And so you'll find that a lot of health conscious women will consume a lot of soy and that may not be the best idea okay. for you. Additionally, I have a problem with soy products, not with like edamame mm -hmm. or things that are soy, but soy products, because soy isn't technically labeled or marketed as a mm. food. So it flies under the radar of a lot of regulation and and standards for what it it should and shouldn't have allowed mm. in it so that's one thing the other thing is you know and it sounds like a broken record player but it it's really the stress it's causing this imbalance of our hormones mm. and the estrogen dominance because it's causing a progesterone deficiency okay. Uh, the other thing that I think is super important is that we think that whatever we eat, we absorb. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, oh, I eat organic or I eat keto or I eat mostly paleo or I eat vegetarian or whatever it is. It's this statement of how mindful people are to a healthier way of mm -hmm. life. They're claiming a lack of junk food, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But you have no idea if you're absorbing it. True. And so we have to remember that the microbiome and the gut is an essential part of hormone balancing. We have to know whether or not we're absorbing that selenium, whether we're absorbing the ashwagandha, we're absorbing the omega-3 fatty acids, because you can't have a production line without the ingredients. Mm, mm. Wow, that's so true. And this speaks again to, I mean, we, we've touched on two this is the second one now, two of the core principles of health that are really coming to prominence now as our research advances and sort of matches ancient knowledge. And the first one is stress, but now the second one is the gut health and the microbiome. This is huge. So you're saying that proper gut function uh, is key because that's going to help us women, you and I, to absorb more nutrients and therefore be able to regulate the chemical messenger system in our body more effectively, right? Yes, and I think you should expect that you are doing a less effective job of absorbing your food as you age. Mm. 
you don't run faster, you don't see better, <laughs> you don't have more hair. There's nothing that gets better at, with age except for maybe appreciation yes. wisdom. <laughs> and, and wisdom love, and, love. Yeah. and wisdom. <laughs> yes, Which they're great exactly. characteristics, so let's enjoy them. <laughs> But yes, I hear you. Yes, but with the physical body, it, it's not amping mm. up. Um, so I don't think that there is a downside to using a natural um, digestive mm. enzyme, at least with one of your yeah. meals, maybe your biggest well, meal. Well, okay, this is great information, people. If you're listening, there's some key points I want you to reflect on so far in this interview. One is stress. I'm taking notes. I hope you are too. One is less gluten. Another one is less scents and smells and artificial fragrance, fragrances. Another one is improving your gut health. Uh, another one is meditation. So these are really great points so far. Um, furthermore to this topic, I remember interviewing Dr. Christine Northrup a number of years ago, and she spoke a lot about um, how exercise and, you know, working out or going for a walk or a run or something could be great to just help improve your mood, your hormones. How, what's, your, what's your thoughts on exercise? And are there types of exercise that are negative? Because I know that a lot of women that do really intense, high intensity workouts, it's maybe not ideal for their body. Um, what do you recommend for women sort of in mid thirties, mid forties, mid fifties, in terms of the best types of exercise to support hormonal health? Well, I love exercise to boost testosterone. There's just so much research. I was very blessed. Um, Dr. Northrop wrote um, a review for my book, The Hormone Beautiful. Secret. And there's lots of research about how exercise actually boosts testosterone. And, you know, testosterone helps your brain, helps your energy, your muscle fat ratio, your bones. I mean, it, it's really set. We, women need a tiny amount, but it has an outsized role in how you look, feel, and mm -hmm. function. With regard to what is the best exercise, there's two answers. The first answer is the one you'll yeah. do. <laughs> if someone said to me, like, you should go running, that's the best exercise for you. I hate running. I won't I'll do run it. to the beach to go surfing, but that's about it. I'll <laughs> run to the water. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But if they said you should go for a walk, and when you're walking, you should run, you should walk fast enough like you're late for an appointment. I can do that. <laughs> and I can enjoy that. Nice. Okay. So, mm -hmm, then me. people ask, well, what time of day? Again, they say morning is the best because then it's done and you, you get it out of the way. Not for me. I've got kids. I've got a dog. I've, there's no way that's going to happen. So for me, my best time is mid-morning when everybody's tucked away and done. I've had a couple of meetings. Then I'm taking sort of like an early mm -hmm. lunch and that's when I do my exercise. Yes. And then it is a real problem for especially some women who are over-exercising. And that may sound like it's impossible. It is absolutely a stress. Mm -hmm. and, and weight loss resistance might actually be because you're not eating enough and you're exercising mm, too much. Interesting. Because your body is saying, I am in a starvation mm. camp. It's a labor starvation mm. camp. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to oh, hang yeah. on. <laughs> wow. Wow. I bet that's probably hit hard for a lot of people listening to this right now. And also, I know for a lot of uh, younger women that are really working out to improve their body shape because there's, well, not younger, I mean, um, uh, all women, but then take on heavy exercise programs and then potentially have fertility issues or have hormonal issues because potentially too much testosterone, not enough progesterone. And, you know, I mean, I remember as, not, not yeah, right and I remember then. David Wolf told me this, he, he made this concept sound so fascinating. He said pro progesterone, progestation, right? Pro make exactly. baby, you know? And it's a really cool right. phrase that helped me understand the hormone better. And then we look at estrogen, which is really this, this dance between the two. You need high, pro, high progesterone, low estrogen. And then there's so much in our environment that boosts our estrogen and drops our progesterone, which is really for women a, a, a dangerous uh, situation to be in, which I think is very common. 
Um, any any other therapies that are sort of non food related, like maybe hot, hot and cold therapy? I know that's very popular right now, or anything. I mean, you talk. It is. And okay, yeah. What supplements or or other therapies that are sort of that we haven't talked spoken about yet, which can help bring this into balance? Well, I think that um, there's a definite thing to know that it, you should call them nutraceuticals. Mm. They're as powerful as pharmaceuticals. Mm-hmm. And my patients tell me, like, they come in with, like, a whole bag. They've listened to 10 yeah. podcasts, and they have 35 different supplements. Yes. <laughs> they don't know if any of them are right for them. They just know they're, they're right. right. Yep. So, yeah, but they don't know if they're right for them or if it's right for mm-hmm. them right now. So... I think that you do need to remember that if you're taking something for the potential of it being potentially powerful enough to do good, it could also do harm. Okay. But there are different supplements that help specific hormones. I have a whole Mm -hmm. section in my book, The Hormone Mm -hmm. Secret, but I love a couple of superstars. One of them is ashwagandha. Mm -hmm. And ashwagandha can can be a food you can make ashwagandha chicken you can you can have it as a Mm. supplement but in the dose of 500 to a thousand milligrams it takes your testosterone which is being carried around your body by something called the sex hormone binding Mm -hmm. globulin and when it's on there it can't do anything it has to get off the bus to go do any work so ashwagandha kicks it off as does maca. Okay. Yes. Maca is the one I was actually thinking of for the chicken, not well, ashwagandha. We can put apologize. There. Ashwagandha, maca, chicken. Why not? Yeah, you can mix them up. <laughs> I normally put like ashwagandha, maca in a, in a smoothie, but that's amazing. Yeah. So, so maca and ashwagandha, these I hear are, are quite apt- adaptogenic in their nature. They work where you yeah. need them, when you need them, and that's a brilliant thing that nature has gifted us. It, it is and it's nice because it doesn't make you feel tired and it doesn't amp you up it it boosts when it needs and it calms when mm-hmm. it needs so that's what I love about adaptogens one for progesterone is chaste okay. berry uh, this is a wonderful supplement it's really hard to get it mm-hmm. in food mm-hmm. <laughs> you kind of have to just get it and about you know 250 milligrams it can support your body's mm-hmm. production of progesterone Beautiful. Um, we mentioned iodine for thyroid. You have to be careful because your body doesn't want just mm. iodine all the time. You should respect Mother Nature and try to do things as closely as possible to mimicking mm. Mother Nature. So in our bodies, it's an iodine iodide okay. combination. And for most people, if there's anything above 12.5 milligrams, you can actually cause thyroid Mm. problems. So there's this sweet spot where too little is problematic and too much is problematic as well. Um, So there's some great supplements on the market that already have iodine and iodide mixed together in the right ratios to mimic mother nature. What about this sort of hot cold therapy, et cetera? So, oh, so, no. so hot right Notice now. Notice I skipped yeah. that because I hate okay, cold. Okay. <laughs> Look, I hate cold too until like I was spent some time. But it's yeah, I spent some time training with Wim, Wim Hof in, in San Francisco in, in, in autumn or fall and it was cold. And he had this ice bath and he's like, okay, James, it's time to get in. And I'm like, okay, if you say so. <laughs> But he learned. He taught. He told me to like cold <laughs> because I didn't like cold before, and it just. I just built a different relationship with it. He. He just basically said the main thing that I need to do, is to observe myself being cold, as opposed to experience myself mm. being cold. And I thought, well, that sounds very spiritual mm. because I've learned a lot of that concept in more spiritual circles when it comes to meditation, mindfulness. It's about being the witness. That witness consciousness concept and Wim was saying the same he's like just witness yourself being cold go oh look at my skin it's red because it's so cold or I've got these goosebumps or or I'm shaking that's interesting and just observe it and not react to it it was fascinating and it really changed my relationship to cold and I I cannot have a hot shower without cold at the end now it's like I need it that's brilliant 
Well, you know, I use a, I use recommendations and do recommend cold therapy and cryotherapy. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my clinics is stem cells, and we have a stem cell clinic in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, and one here nice. in Seattle, and it's great for decreasing inflammation. Yes. And inflammation is kind of the source of everything that mm. ails us. <laughs> so it's really, really good. The other thing is, before I went to medical school, I danced as a soloist in a ballet company for many, many years. That was my nice. first career. And so we did a lot of cold therapy on specific areas. And people forget that there's two benefits of cold therapy. One is the cold, right? We're mm -hmm. dropping that inflammation. But the second is when you get out, the body rushes all fresh blood and all fresh nutrients to the area to warm it up. And that's very mm. healing. Wow. Okay. And so this doesn't speak to heat therapy. We're just speaking about cold therapy, right? That's correct. Yes. Just your body's own ability to get back to yes, room temperature yeah, yeah. <laughs> requires a rush to of the blood. Yeah, beautiful. That's amazing. Yes. And one yeah. thing that we've touched on multiple times throughout this masterclass today was this concept of inflammation being bad for everything. It's bad for hormones, it's bad for our skin, it's bad for aging. And it's such a topic that's really hot right now. I mean, a lot of people are concerned with inflammation. From your perspective as a hormone, specialist but also as a, as a medical doctor and you've experienced so much from being on the remote islands of Vanuatu as a, as a, as a, as a doctor there to now running clinics and stem cell clinics in, like you say in California and Mexico um, you know you've seen a lot and experienced a lot but what is your take on inflammation in terms of key foods or things to avoid and key things to eat or 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 supplements or, or um, you know, medicinal herbs to consume more of to fight inflammation? Well, and I think the very be best way to start with the conversation about inflammation and the treatment of inflammation with what you eat and what you consume and, and supplements is simplicity mm. is king. So what I mean by that is eating lower on the food chain, no matter what you mm. believe, is going to result in less okay. inflammation. So you might think and love and need a grass-fed, grass-finished steak, and it has great iron in it and things like that, but that will cause more inflammation than a huge plate of mm. vegetables. So and nuts and seeds and, and things like that. So, you know, there's individual sensitivities that we always have to be aware of. You know, penicillin saves most people's lives. It kills other people. Nuts are yeah. the same. Yeah. <laughs> so you, yeah. have to, you have to respect what's right and what's mm -hmm. right for you. But lower on the food chain equals less inflammation. And it also has been translated, there's actually Australia has a study that shows that your level of happiness is directly correlated to the number of vegetables and fruit. Notice I say vegetables and fruit, mm. not fruit and vegetables, up to, guess, 13. Wow. 13 wow. servings. So after 13 servings a day, you aren't going to be more happy. But if you eat more and more and more and more vegetables per day, there is an absolute correlation between wow, happiness. Wow, that's insane. I mean, the governments are telling us three to five servings. And oh, Yeah, but the governments are only interested in you not dropping dead. That's like waking up and saying, yay, today I didn't die. Wow, this is, this is big news. So, okay, so you're saying up to 13 serves, but above 13, there's no extra benefit, but up to 13... For happiness. For happiness. <laughs> but speaking to inflammation, this is such a such an important topic. So lower on the food chain means more plants, fruit, uh, roots, vegetables, nuts, seeds, seaweeds, herbs, etc. And then even lower on the chain, animal products too, because we know like fish, for instance, like sardines, uh, mackerel, herring, are better than tuna, swordfish, etc. Because there's heavy metal uh, implications, etc. Well, and you eat what they eat. Yes. yes, that's true. So anti-inflammatory diet is, is key in this hormone discussion as well. 
And then the second thing mm-hmm. is fat. You know, t- m- most of your brain is fat. If somebody calls you fathead, it's a really big compliment. <laughs> So you, we have an omega-6 and an inflammatory predominant mm-hmm. diet. And so if you want to have an anti-inflammatory system, you're going to consume more omega-3s. And be careful by just popping, you know, the thing, the supplements, the fish oil tablets that you found in the grocery mm-hmm. store. Because rancid omega-3s are almost yeah, wow. worse wow. for you. If you f- burp fishy, mm. it's rancid. Okay, that's big. And so then there's other forms of omega-3 from a plant-based source that are also could be healthy, like flax, for instance. But then flax oil can very often be rancid. I mean, I know that I smell it. It's not very, you know, it has to be stored in like a mirror and glass. But if you take fresh flax seeds, that's something, or hemp seeds, for instance. And if you mm-hmm. grind them. Okay. You know, it can release the oils and you know, I think that everybody, it, one of the best mm-hmm. ways to lose weight is to store organic flax seeds yes. in your freezer before you eat, about 30 minutes before you eat lunch and before yes. you eat dinner, grind them up and put one to two huge tablespoons in a glass of water and drink it. The omega-3s and the fiber will fill mm-hmm. you up in a good way and you mm. will lose weight. Wow. Wow. You heard it here first, people. There's so many great tips today. But one of the last things I want to circle back on, Dr. Temi, was this idea of you not leaving your home if there's a fire without... What did you say? The two things you said. Your, yes. My children and my progesterone. Okay, your children and your progesterone. So when you say your progesterone, you're talking about a topical cream here? Are you talking about a supplement? Or what are you talking about? So I have bioidentical oral Mm -hmm. progesterone. Oral progesterone crosses the blood-brain barrier Mm -hmm. and it's based on my blood Mm -hmm. result, so I know the dose Mm -hmm. that it should be. Um, And I I take it, I remember going to speak at a conference in Florida and I was on the airplane absolutely like sweat Mm. panic that I forgot my progesterone. I was Googling, um, you know, naturopathic pharmacies and compounding pharmacies. (laughs) Because you've been taking it and you know that it works, right? Yeah, and you know, people say to me, Dr. Tammy, how are you so energetic all the time? How come you're positive Mm. all the time? You seem to be able to think clearly all the time. There are two things that I give to myself as an essential but beautiful gift every day. One is I prioritize and plan a great night's sleep that is a minimum okay. of eight hours. And that includes progesterone. <laughs> okay, you take it before you go to bed. Okay. Yes. And then the second is meditation. Mm. If I, I believe that cortisol is going to happen like we talked about it you're not Mm. going to get rid of stress your body is going to react and that cortisol is inflammatory and it's it's like Mm. eating Mm. right and the food just gets all over Mm. our teeth and just like the food on our teeth that if it sits there we get cavities gum disease we now know that the bacteria in our gum can cause Mm. heart disease it's Mm. terrible the same thing happens when you let cortisol sit all over mm. your cells okay. Medita- so what do we do well, we can't stop eating we also can't stop mm. stress and the production of cortisol so with eating what what do we do we will brush and yes. we floss yes. we clean it up meditation is brushing and flossing the cortisol off every cell of your body wow I love that analogy. That's beautiful. It's my goal that when people go to bed at night, that if they didn't meditate, they should feel as yucky as if they didn't brush their teeth. (laughs) And everyone knows the feeling of not brushing their teeth, right? Okay, that's great. I love it. 
Well, Dr. Tammy, you have been an absolute resource today. And I know that you're such a divine teacher in this space. I mean, having connected with you that first time, maybe five or seven years ago, who knows? It was, it was, it was quite a while ago. A while. And, yeah. Shh, don't tell them. We're, 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 we're so young. young. And, you know, the impact that, you know, your advice around the progesterone from either orally or, or topically even, which I, I think I also was, was sharing with Laurentine and, and, and many other women since then. It's, it's had a profound impact on their health. And I'm so grateful for the work that you do and the books that you've written uh, and, and or the book that you've written and also the clinics that you operate. So thank you so much for your uh, expertise. And I hope that everybody listening to this today has been able to receive some of this incredible wisdom and guidance and has taken lots of notes. Dr. Temi, I'm so grateful that we got to connect again today. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for that illuminating discussion many years ago. Um, well, let's just say a couple of years ago. We don't want to age ourselves too much. You look exactly like you did when I last met you. And uh, so your <laughs> clinic and the work that you do, obviously pays dividends so well done thank you so much for your time and grateful for you thank you thank you for this wonderful opportunity to help people be the ceo of their own health you're doing such great work for everything that we've mentioned in today's episode you can check out the show notes there will be links and information there for you and before I go, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to invest in yourself and be here for this podcast. If there's anybody that you can think of who could benefit from this information, please make sure to share it with them. We believe in the power of life-changing information, and it's especially powerful when it's shared from a trusted source. And finally, if you could leave us a comment or make sure to subscribe to the podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. It helps us continue to bring you this life-changing information and make sure that you get all future podcast updates sent to you. Have a beautiful day and thank you once again.